Well, we all might be sick of talking about one specific virus. No worries, we won't get into that one today. There are things we should actually be thanking viruses for, because I'm going to tell you today what viruses have to do with you being alive. And as much as I like talking about bigger things, things big enough to see with my own eyes, there are pretty fascinating and important things in that basic realm of the tree of life. We're going to get into the basic division on the tree of life and talk about viruses, which technically aren't even alive. This video was originally an audio only because I was dealing with a health nightmare. If you want to know what the solution to that was, there's a video on my channel about how I was diagnosed and what that means now and why I'm finally getting better. Also, I was in the busiest part of my studies and really suffering at school because it was just way too much with my health issues. But now that I have time again and I can prioritize this channel and my podcast because that's what I want to do with my life. I love doing this. I'm re-recording the first six episodes of the Climbing the Tree of Life series so that the Tree of Life series is going to be a complete thing. That means that this time we're going to talk about the viruses, next time we're going to get into the plankton community, there's also an episode I'm re-recording on sea grasses and algae, and one on the sponges and one on the cnidaria, so sea corals and jellies. And everything above that I've already started and a lot of that is already published. Right now we're up to the mollusks, so talking about squid and octopuses and the like on the current version of where we are with the Tree of Life series. But I really, really wanted it to be complete from the beginning, so I'm catching up from the bottom. Last time we already talked about the Luca. That's the last universal common ancestor, that great, 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 dot, 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 great, 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 great grandfather of every living species. It's the last universal common ancestor. So the first split happened about 3.5 billion years ago between the Archaea and the Eubacteria, and they went their separate ways. And then shortly after, on a time scale that's so big we can't comprehend it, the eukaryotes branched off again from the Archaea. The organism at the base of that fork is the Lika, the last eukaryotic common ancestor. Yeah, I know, they are so good with names. But what distinguishes the prokaryotes from the eukaryotes? So the prokaryotes are typically smaller, which kind of makes sense, because for all intents and purposes, they are single-celled. Yes, I know, technically, there are multicellular bacteria, like cyanobacteria, but we're not getting into that, and even then, they are few-celled. Whereas eukaryotes have multicellularity and many cellularity. I mean, just think about how many cells you are made from, so on average, they are definitely bigger than the prokaryotes. One of the most interesting differences between the eukaryotes and prokaryotes is how they store their genetic material. The eukaryotes store their genetic material pretty protected, so they put it in the shell, the nucleus, where they store their genetic material in the chromosomes. Well, the prokaryotes don't do that. They just have their genetic material floating around in the liquid inside their cells. The cell walls of prokaryotes are usually pretty complex, which is probably a good thing if you're storing your genetic materials behind those walls without further protection. Eukaryotes can or cannot have cell walls. Animals like us don't have cell walls at all, but plants have cell walls made from sugars, so saccharides, and fungal cell walls are made from chitin, so the same thing that the exoskeleton of a bee is made from and the beak of an octopus. What I found interesting is that so many bacteria are toxic because they simply suck at waste management. If you are single-celled and there is no inner division, there is exactly one place for the toxins and the waste to go into your cell's liquid, whereas eukaryotes just warn them off with a little skin balloon, essentially, of the zecal, then press them toward the cell wall and get rid of them to the outside. So how did we get from here to multicellularity? So I can finally talk about things that are a little more interesting to me and I know more about, well, bigger and better things. Philosophical question, are we actually better than bacteria? Hmm, interesting thought. Not getting into that today. Multicellularity, right? Multicellularity has developed independently at least 50 times that we know of, so probably a lot more often. So it's a pretty big deal and seems to be pretty useful. 
But how did it develop? Well, there's this theory that's called an endosymbiotic theory. Remember that in science, a theory is something that's more established, whereas a hypothesis is what normal people call a theory. I know it's a little confusing, but to become a theory, you have to have a hypothesis first. People talked about it and did experiments and figured shit out, and then it's a theory in science. Not like when you say, I have a theory about what happened at that party. Not the same thing. Scientists need a little more proof to call something a theory. Anyway, endosymbiotic theory. It's essentially a theory where bigger organisms try to eat smaller organisms and instead made them part of themselves and engulfed them. There's this really cool pioneer called an alpha proteobacterium. Might not sound cool, but is pretty cool. It was the first thing to figure out how to breathe, so that's a pretty big deal. When it got engulfed by bigger anaerobic bacteria, instead of getting eaten, it just stayed inside and became an organelle. We'll get into organelles in a minute. But essentially, it allowed the bigger anaerobic bacteria to breathe without figuring it out for themselves. And thus, we had the beginning of all the heterotroph um, organisms, that's animals and us and all that. You already know how cool they think cyanobacteria are. Well, they knew how to photosynthesize. So when they got engulfed by this now no longer anaerobic bacterium, we had the beginning of plants because now those heterotroph organisms were suddenly um, able to figure out how to make energy from the sunlight. And we had the beginning of all plants. So in a way, cyanobacteria is what all plants started with. Every single plant on this planet is somehow related to cyanobacteria. The little cyanobacteria became an organelle called the chloroplast. But mitochondria and chloroplasts aren't the only organelles. Multicellular organisms are pretty good at making specialized cells. Eukaryotes have a lot of them. So here's an oversimplified summary, which I'm really bad at, so I'm gonna sneak peek at my laptop every once in a while to make sure I'm not talking bullshit. Anyway, there's the nucleus. That's where the genetic information is stored. Attached to the nucleus, we find the endoplasmatic reticulum, the ER. There are two versions of this, a rough one and a smooth one. You've got the nucleus, then attached to that is this, the rough ER, and then attached to that is the smooth ER. The rough ER is involved in protein folding, quality assurance, as well as tagging things for their final destination. The smooth ER has quite a few responsibilities. It's involved in lipids, so fat manufacture and the metabolism, as well as steroid hormone production and detoxification. That's quite the list. The Golgi body takes the proteins that were manufactured by the ER and modifies them so they do whatever we need them to do. It also creates something called a lysosome, which is an enzyme-filled skin balloon vesicle um, and is important for breaking down molecules. Then there's the vacuole, which is important in plants because it makes up about 90% of the cell's volume. It's essentially responsible for keeping up the cell pressure. If you look at some plants, they get all saggy when they don't have enough water. That means they can't keep up the turgor, so the cell pressure, because they don't have enough liquid to store in their vacuoles. Give them water, they fill up the vacuoles, and they are fine again. Some animals have vacuoles as well, but they don't get involved in all that pressure stuff. Instead, they uh, they store food, water, and other materials. Well, and if you get those together with the lysosomes, which have these enzymes that break down molecules, you can do waste management because they can get rid of waste and worn out cell parts and whatever they need to get rid of. The cytoplasm, the cell's own liquid, has two parts. It has all the organelles and it has the actual liquid, the cytosol. The cytosol is a gel-like watery liquid with enzymes and cytoskeleton filaments, but mostly water. We already kind of talked about the chloroplasts. Well, they are where photosynthesis happens. So you take carbon dioxide and energy from the sun and you make energy in form of sugars that the cells then can use and water. We also talked about the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell, which is where breathing happens. We already kind of talked about the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, but just as a quick recap, chloroplasts is where photosynthesis happens. So you put in energy from the sun and carbon dioxide and you get out energy in the form of sugars that the organism then can use and water. And the mitochondria are very active in the metabolism and really, really important for keeping everything going. All of these are surrounded by the cell membrane. 
a lipid bilayer, so two layer of fats working together to keep everything tight. In organisms like plants that have a cell wall, the cell wall is then attached to the plant membrane. So you've got the plant membrane, then you've got the cell wall, and then you've got the membrane of the next cell. And then there are the fungi. They are really kind of like in between the plants and the animals. They have cell walls, but they don't have chloroplasts. And they kind of just really mix everything up and don't make sense. And then for some things, they do their own thing. We'll definitely need to have a closer look at the fungi at some point, because you know I like weirdos. And with that, we've talked enough about the little shit. Let's move on and get the viruses covered, because viruses are super cool despite what's going on at the moment and how sucky viruses are. But that's actually just something you need to give viruses credit for. If you can get something credit that isn't alive, We've all had enough of viruses to last us a lifetime, and it's very easy to surmise that viruses are all bad. But that's just not true. If I've learned anything from being forced to read a 24-page article in the National Geographic about viruses, it's that viruses are vastly important. Without viruses, mammals wouldn't exist, and you are a mammal, so that alone should probably be reason enough to look into them. If you're really interested, that 24-page article is actually really good, and I can recommend reading it. In general, viruses are pretty involved in evolution and population control. In the ocean, that leads to a very special extra role that we'll also get into. But before we dive into any of that, let's cover the basics. So what is a virus? Viruses aren't alive in the traditional sense, though there are viruses that can infect other viruses and there's the philosophical question, can something get sick and not be alive? There's the giant mama virus, which is so big that it can get infected by other viruses. And it just there's so many weird things about viruses that it's very hard to say if they are alive or not. The general consensus seems to be that they are not because they don't fill all the criteria of life. There's an entire Khan Academy post that outlines all the criteria for being alive and how viruses fulfill them or not. But as it technically doesn't matter if they're alive or not, let's move on. Viruses are essentially genetic material encapsulated in something called an envelope or a shell or whatever you want to call it, and then there are outer proteins which can attach to the host and infect it. Viruses are characterized by their genetic material, so if they have double-stranded or single-stranded material, if they have DNA or RNA, and by the type of their envelope. All viruses have a primitive shell, but some are enveloped and some are non-enveloped. Yeah, depending on what genetic material they have, they need the host for different parts of the genetic manufacturing process. Remember that first episode where we talked about RNA and how it created evolution and it's likely where life started everything? I keep wondering how it connects to viruses. There are viruses that are essentially just RNA encapsulated, and then it spreads from there. And technically, we're all just houses for RNA. So did RNA just evolve to build itself different houses and in the viruses it went the easy way and with us it built elaborate complex houses? It's a weird thought. Okay, there's a coccolithophore called Emiliania huxley, or Ehux for short, and its corresponding virus, Ehux86. And they've been at this evolutionary arms race for quite a while. And they are calling it the Red Queen effect because as one evolves, the other evolves, one evolves, the other evolves. And there's something the Queen, the Red Queen said in look, through their looking glass, which was that if you stand still, you're not you're moving backwards essentially, and you have to keep running to stand still. So if either side stops evolving, they get outpaced by the others. So they keep going and going and going and essentially just get more specialized to each other and better at detecting and warding off. And it's really freaky cool how these two are getting each other just this evolutionary arms race. Ehex as a coccolithophore has two different life stages, haploid and diploid. In the diploid phase, it's asexual division, and that's how the coccolithophore blooms happen. So they evolve very quickly, and they just bloom, and there's a lot of them. But that's also the stage where they are vulnerable to this virus, the Ehex 86. So when one gets infected by the virus, it sends a signal to its friends that they now need to ward off against the virus. And they switch to the sexual version, the haploid stage, where they essentially are completely um, invisible to the virus. The virus can only detect them when they are in their asexual stage. So they disappear like that, like that grin on the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire cat effect. 
But even though coccolithophores might be marginally more interesting than viruses, let's return to our virus friends, shall we? Because we need to find a round of knowledge before we can talk about the ocean, the virus life cycle. As I said, they reproduce to evolve, and they reproduce a lot. They have two, day, two ways to do so, but remember, there is no virus sex. They aren't even alive in the traditional sense. Viruses can follow the lytic or the lysogenic cycle. And technically, there's a third way that often gets ignored, which is especially cool because it doesn't damage the host cells. So let's look at all three of those options. Let's start with the lytic cycle. Okay, so viruses are pretty sneaky bastards. Can you be a bastard if you don't have parents? Anyway, they penetrate the host cell and inject their genetic material. I know this sounds a lot like virus sex, but there's nothing sexy about this, I promise. So they inject the genetic material into the host cell, and the unfair thing is that the next step is usually a latency phase, where nothing happens. That's the stage where people go outside and spread the virus around because they don't feel sick. Sound remember? Yeah, I know. Oh yeah, there's that pandemic that taught some of us how viruses work. Don't worry, we won't get into R values today. Though it's actually not that hard. The R value is just how many people get infected by one person. So an R value of one means one person infects one other person. An R value of two means that one person infects two other people. There, done. You understand R values now. Not that hard, right? After the latency phase, biogenesis happens. The host is abused to recreate new genetic Material. And then when there are enough and they're ready to go out on their own, it really sounds like growing up. Remember, viruses are not alive. Yeah, okay. So when they're ready to go out on their own, they rupture out of the host cell in a process called lysis. The lysogenic cycle is actually very similar, just introduces a few extra steps along the way. So let's have a look at that one. In the lysogenic version of this, the host DNA doesn't get destroyed. Instead, the virus adds its own DNA in between the host DNA, so that when the host replicates its own DNA, the virus gets replicated alongside. At some point when the environment condition change, like for example higher temperature or something like that, then the bit of DNA breaks off and the whole lytic cycle starts over. As mentioned before, there is a third way where the host cell doesn't even get damaged. So there's no lysis where everything just bursts out of the cell and destroys the cell. It is a lot slower though, so the virus is reproducing a lot more slowly. They use budding, so they create these little skin balloons that then merge with the host cell wall and then push out a few of the virus cells every single time without ever damaging the wall. But it's just a few, whereas in a lysis process there's a lot of virus bursting out of the cell. While not a symbiotic relationship, I mean the virus takes without giving, it's probably still preferably to be invaded by a minimally invasive virus. And with that, I finally get to tell you what viruses have to do with the climate. The ocean is a pretty big carbon thing. You probably know that by now. I mean, trees are nothing against the ocean. Okay, so small things get eaten by bigger things, get eaten by bigger things, and so on. At some point, all these organisms poop, and their poop is perfectly shaped and has the perfect density to sink to the bottom of the ocean quickly. In addition, there's more carbon stored in the actual organisms, and when the organisms die and don't get eaten to become poop, they too sink to the bottom of the ocean. And I probably don't have to tell you that the bottom of the ocean is far, far away from the atmosphere and that carbon dioxide stored at the bottom of the ocean does not actually affect the climate. Yeah, you probably have seen documentaries where whale fall happens, like an entire giant whale carcass sinking to the bottom of the ocean. So where do viruses come into that? Well, they actually play a vastly important role in marine food webs. When there are a lot of viruses, they infect more of the phytoplankton. When they infect, for example, coccolithophores like EHAX we talked about earlier, more of them die. And dead phytoplankton isn't delicious, so they don't get eaten by the next rung up. Instead, they get dissolved back into the water column by bacteria and stuff like that. So when there is a lot of viruses around, there's actually less export of carbon dioxide to the deep ocean. Not the biggest fan of viruses if they are bad for the climate. But I promised I would tell you what viruses have to do with you being born, so that I can maybe redeem them a little bit, because you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't get to hate them if you weren't born. So yes, there's good viruses, there are bad viruses, and things happen and none of them are actually good or bad because remember they aren't alive. So anyway. So when viruses infect the hosts, they aren't perfect. Sometimes they take some of the genetic material from one host to the other, or they fuck it up a little bit and something mutates. 
two of those mutations led to the mammal placenta. So the only reason why your mom could get pregnant with you is that she has a mutation caused by two viruses. And that actually happens a lot. Viruses are really, really important for evolution because they are part of moving genes from organism to organism. Something that usually only happens from parent to child. There are a few examples of horizontal gene transfer, but viruses just speed up evolution and make things happen that would probably not have happened without them. So from an evolutionary standpoint, and because of that whole placenta thing, I can appreciate that viruses are important for us. But much like fruit flies, I'd prefer if they are important somewhere far away from me. And with that, I'm gonna let you go here. I enjoy making these episodes a lot. They are so much fucking fun, but they are also a lot of work. If you want to help me keep making them, consider supporting me on Patreon for as little as two bucks a month or buying me a coffee as a one-time donation. In addition, there's ways without money that you can help me out with. Tell your friends about me, spread the word about me, like, subscribe, comment, or search for my name on your favorite podcast app and rate my podcast so that other people see the podcast and check it out even if they haven't heard about me before. These things help more than you can know. As always, a special thank you to my loyal patrons Robert and Paul who've been with me for a while and pledge money to me every month, and to the lovely people who have sent one-time donations. You all rock, you're awesome, until next time, weirdly yours, Kate Hillenbrand.